Another part of the physiology of blood vessels is when we consider factors that affect blood flow as it travels through the circulatory system, which is referred to as hemodynamics. Hemo means blood, while dynamics means ever-changing. So the volume of blood flowing through our tissues, our vessels and organs, and our entire circulatory system in a given amount of time is referred to as blood flow. And in fact, if we look at the units, milliliters per minute, that essentially means cardiac output. Because we're considering blood flow through the entire vascular system, then blood flow is related to cardiac output. Because after all, cardiac output means how much the heart is pumping blood from the left ventricle into that aorta. So there are two factors that influence blood flow. One factor is pressure. The differences in pressure from one area versus the other. So rather than looking at the pressure differences, we are just going to consider the mean arterial pressure, which we can abbreviate as MAP. So what I did here is I wrote out that the difference in pressure is proportional to MAP. And again, MAP stands for mean arterial pressure. So rather than looking at the differences of pressure from point A versus to point B, we're gonna consider MAP instead. Another factor that affects or influences blood flow will be resistance. And this variable is written with a big R. So R capitalized means resistance. So anything that hinders, anything that resists the flow of blood in any given vessel. It could be a specific vessel or overall. We're going to be considering what happens at that blood vessel. So anything that resists that flow of blood is referred to as resistance. We have two ways to measure resistance. We have what's called systemic vascular resistance. We could also measure it by looking at the total peripheral resistance, TPR. So rather than looking at either or, we're just gonna refer to it as resistance in general, because what we're trying to do here is simplify this. So just think resistance as a whole. So whether it's systemic vascular resistance or total peripheral resistance, just think resistance. Something that again resists or hinders or tries to slow down that blood flow. So when we put these variables together, we come up with this equation, okay? And what I've done here is manipulated the equation by substituting the particular variables based upon what we just went over. So in other words, rather than looking at blood flow, we're going to say cardiac output. Rather than looking at the changes of pressure, then we're just gonna consider MAP. Rather than looking at any specific resistance, SVR or TPR, we're just gonna put big R, meaning resistance. So if we manipulate this equation, then we come up with this right here, where MAP equals cardiac output times resistance. I would like you to memorize this equation. Okay, so please know that MAP equals cardiac output times resistance. Another big factor that will affect MAP is our blood volume. So this blood volume is monitored by our kidney, something that we're gonna see later when we get to the urinary system. When we think about cardiac output, I need you to think about the heart, right? Why? Because if you recall the equation for cardiac output, cardiac output equals stroke volume times heart rate. That has to do with our heart. If you see the resistance, big R, then I need you to think blood vessels, okay? Because after all, we're looking at blood flow through our blood vessels. What about this MAP, okay? Mean arterial pressure. And we can also just refer to it as simply blood pressure in general, okay? So this would be ventricular contraction that generates the blood pressure. Which ventricular contraction 
as far as our blood pressure is concerned, it's the left. So it's the left ventricular contraction that generates our blood pressure. Hydrostatic pressure that pushes up against the blood vessel wall. So something that we looked at with the capillary, right? Your blood hydrostatic pressure, that perpendicular pressure that's pushing up against the wall of the blood vessel and the one that we considered was the capillary. Blood pressure is highest in the aorta. Why? Because it's coming from the heart, right? When the left ventricle contracts, it generates a systolic pressure of 120 millimeters of mercury. That's the blood pressure in the aorta. And it also will propagate along those large elastic arteries. This is why we can measure our blood pressure around our brachial artery. Even though, of course, that's not the aorta, it's because that pressure propagates from the aorta into those large elastic arteries, and your brachial artery happens to be one of them. Now, you will also see later that blood pressure will progressively fall. So as the blood is flowing through the circulatory system, beginning at the aorta, pressure will begin to drop. And one of the reasons for that is because of resistance. So we'll look at a graph where we're going to see this decrease in blood pressure as it's making its way through systemic circulation. And by the time it arrives into the superior and inferior vena cava, that pressure has dropped substantially. So if we compare the pressure of the aorta with the pressure in the superior inferior vena cava, it doesn't even come close. The pressure in the superior and inferior vena cava is so low, but it's still higher than the pressure in the chambers of our heart when our heart is completely relaxed. So during passive filling, when all four chambers of our heart, that pressure in those chambers is very low. So the pressure in the superior and inferior vena cava will be slightly higher. And this is what's going to allow blood to passively fill our heart. So systolic blood pressure is the highest blood pressure attained in the arteries during systole. And again, that represents when our ventricle, left ventricle, fully contracts, left ventricular systole. Our diastolic blood pressure, which again represents the afterload, the back pressure when our left ventricle is completely relaxed. And in this slide, it's showing us 70 millimeters of mercury. This is not the pressure that's found or measured in that left ventricle. That represents the afterload. That is the pressure being applied to that aortic semilunar valve when the left ventricle is completely relaxed, when it's in diastole. So let's look at the pressure graph as blood is making its way through the various blood vessels and, of course, beginning with the left ventricle. So as we see with this graph, the y-axis is the pressure in millimeters of mercury. And looking at this right here, we can see that when the left ventricle is fully relaxed, the pressure is quite low. However, if we look at the pressure in the artery beginning at the aorta, during that period of time, the pressure would be 80. So if we sort of do this, you could see that it's at 80 millimeters of mercury. And that again is the afterload, the back pressure pushing against the aortic semilunar valve when the left ventricle is completely in systole. So as blood is making its way through the circulatory system, beginning with the arteries, and of course all systemic arteries are derived from the massive aorta, and then it gives us our elastic arteries, flows into our muscular arteries, and then eventually it flows into the smallest branches of arteries called arterioles. So looking at the graph, we still have the systolic pressure and the diastolic pressure.
meaning as blood travels through the arterial system, we will still feel a pulse. It's referred to as being pulsatile. So we feel that boom, 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 when we measure the pulse as blood is making its way through the arteries. However, as blood continues to flow to the next type of blood vessel, the capillaries, the site of exchange where that reabsorption filtration occurs, you can see now that there is no longer that pulsatile. We don't have the diastolic systolic pressure. When blood reaches the venules and veins, we definitely no longer have the systolic diastolic pressure and eventually into the right atrium. Another thing we can interpret from this graph is there is a sharp drop in the pressure as we go from the arteries into the arteriole. So I'll highlight that segment right there, okay? So it's a sudden drop. It's as if all of a sudden a ball has rolled down that hill. It was steady at one point, and then all of a sudden it drops. So that drop in pressure happens in that arteriole, and you're going to see why that is later. And eventually the pressure continues to fall, but not at that sharp decline like we have in the arterioles. So if you measure the pulse in a vein, you're not going to feel a pulse because you're not going to have the systolic diastolic pressure. So if we sever a vein, blood flows out in a steady fashion. However, if we sever an artery, it's not just going to flow out in a steady fashion. Instead, it's going to come out in spurts. In other words, the pulsation that's associated with the artery. And of course, if you palpate the artery, you will feel that pulsing. So no pulse is felt in the capillary. No pulse will be felt in any vein. Now, there are some calculations that we're going to have to do, one of which is MAP, mean arterial pressure. So MAP, again, is a change in pressure when we compare one point or one area versus the other. So there's two ways to calculate MAP, which incidentally is non-pulsatile, okay? So if we look at the mean arterial pressure in our graph once again, you could see that it's this line, okay? And we stop right there when it comes to the mean arterial pressure. Why? It's because it says arterial. It doesn't say capillary or venule. So once blood flows into the capillary, then we no longer have a mean arterial pressure. So how do we calculate the mean arterial pressure? Well, there's two ways to do it. One way is to take the diastolic blood pressure, and then we take the systolic blood pressure, subtract that from the diastolic blood pressure, and divide it by three. Then we add these values together. So I did the math, and I calculated 93.3 millimeters of mercury. This is MAP, the mean arterial pressure. There's another way that I prefer, it's much easier, I think, is if we take one-third of the systolic blood pressure and two-thirds of the diastolic blood pressure and add those values together. And again, I did the math. So I calculated 93.2 millimeters of mercury. And if we round these values off, we have 93 millimeters of mercury. So that's the map. So whether you use this or this, you technically should come up with the same value, especially if we round it off. And ideally, our map should be between 70 to 110 millimeters of mercury because what this is representing is pressure that's needed to push the blood in the forward direction, the pressure that's needed to propel the blood to reach our tissues. And of course, it's got to come back to the heart, the right side of the heart. So we don't want our map to be less than 70 millimeters of mercury, and we certainly don't want our map to be higher than 110 millimeters of mercury. Now, when it comes to pulse pressure, pulse pressure is the pressure changes that occur in the arterial system, in the arterial tree. 
This does not apply to capillaries or venules, and the reason why is because we don't have a pulse anymore once we pass the arterioles. So this is a little simpler to calculate. And all we do is take the systolic blood pressure and subtract that from the diastolic blood pressure. So I did the math, and I calculated 40 millimeters of mercury. Ideally, we want the pulse pressure to be between 40 to 60 millimeters of mercury. So that's the target for our pulse pressure. Because if our pulse pressure is less than 40 millimeters of mercury, so at rest, then that means something is wrong with the heart. The heart is not pumping enough volume of blood to reach our cells. So it could be a decrease in stroke volume. It could be due to congestive heart failure. It could be due to blood loss. It could also be due to aortic stenosis, where the aortic semilunar valve has become stiff and calcified. So rather than those valves opening completely when the left ventricle contracts, it doesn't. If at rest, our pulse pressure is elevated, higher than 60 millimeters of mercury, then that means there must be excessive resistance in the arteries, too much resistance in the flow of blood. And I think we'll get a better understanding when we actually look at resistance and look at Poisson's equation in the next slide. And right over here, I was just trying to illustrate again how the blood is propelled in the forward direction as it travels through our arteries and our arteries, especially the elastic arteries, can readily expand as you see here as it's receiving blood when our left ventricle contracts because we're considering systemic circulation and then eventually it recoils and as it recoils, blood is then pushed in that forward direction and this is going to travel through the rest of the arterial tree and eventually we lose this expansion and recoiling once we arrive at the capillaries. Nor are we going to have this in any of our veins.